My name is Marco Bielonic and I'm here with Dimitrios Kanulas. And we are proud today to have Claudio Semini here as giving a speech, speech about the quadruped robots for heavy duty operations. He's the head of the Dynamic Legged Systems Lab at IIT. And there's not much word needed to describe his career. I think he became most famous with his four-legged robot HiQ. And with his newest version, HiQ Real, he was even able to pull a whole airplane. So let's see what he will show us today. So the stage is yours, Claudio. Uh, thank you, Marco. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Let me share the screen. Yes. Okay. We can see your presentation well. Thank okay. You. Excellent. So thanks a lot, Marco and Dimitrios and your organizers for inviting me again for this uh, very prestigious and uh, interesting, exciting workshop series on legged robots. Uh, today I'm going to talk about quadruped robots for heavy duty operations. And for those that don't know me, um, the Dynamic Leg Systems app that I'm leading has about 13 years of experience. And we're mainly doing the design control planning of dynamic legged systems. So far, this has mainly been hydraulic quadruped robots. And you can see in a timeline here that we've uh, developed several versions of it. But actually, um, almost the majority of our research is not going into the hardware design of the machines, but it goes into the locomotion control, the, uh, the locomotion research. And for that, I started to make some slides about the DLS lab history of quadruped research, just to give you an idea of, of where we're coming from and, and how things have been developed. Early on in 2008, during my PhD thesis, I built the first version of uh, a high leg prototype. Here in the video, you can see we did some very basic open loop um, uh, hopping. This is just an open loop trajectory in position control. And later on, we kept the position angles here and dropped the robot with some weight on top. And you can see that there's a lot of inherent flexibility here. And this is mainly due to the long uh, hoses um, you can probably see with my mouse, the long hoses here from the cylinders to the, to the uh, valves that are positioned here on the table uh, create this uh, hydraulic flexibility. That is not always nice because then it reduces the, the, uh, the control bandwidth, of course. And the same approach with a, a, a better design of the leg, but it's the same valves that were mounted this time on top of the torso, we've been using for the very first version of HiQ that was uh, doing its first steps in September 2010. And you can see it, it looks very bad. Uh, this is actually um, uh, trajectories that were offline generated in a simulator that is based on, on little dog code. At that point, Jonas Buchli was uh, with me in, in, in the lab and we've just converted these trajectories and, and, and replayed them on, on the quadruped. But you can see it's very, very shaky. A little bit later, still with the same servo valves on the top, we can see, uh, we also added here spring-loaded lower legs. We can see that the robot is trotting, but it's quite um, uh, badly behaved. And so that's why the... So that's why um, we've started to... Well, get rid of the zoom. All right. All right. So that's why we started in 2011 to use servo valves. These are the uh, small servo valves of MOOC that we've been implementing on the robot. And you can see that we can achieve a very good uh, torque control performance. On the left, you can see the leg is, is uh, following trajectories uh, in, in, in five hertz, and this works very, very well. That allowed us to implement uh, joint impedance control, so virtual stiffnesses and damping. This can happen both in leg space, as you can see in the video in the middle, but this can also happen in uh, torso space where we can adjust, for example, roll and pitch, uh, damping and, and stiffness. And this was only thanks to these uh, very high performance and fast switching uh, servo valves. These servo valves allowed us then to do uh, a bunch of, of locomotion research where the robot was doing a trotting at two meters per second in the, in the, in the top middle, the robot can brace uh, lateral impacts and do very fast lateral motions because the, the torque controller allows us to have a, 
uh, a feed forward term in which we can pre-calculate what is the torque and needed to do this motion and we can do much less in the in the feedback control so we need to do less corrections and uh, that allowed us also to do a, a flying trot here uh, in the bottom left we, we do a flying trot where the robot has moments in which all the four legs are up in the air and this was back in 2015 and there was no physical spring in the system and i think we were uh, the first ones to show that with purely active impedance then in the um, uh, on the treadmill here, for example, we have um, just random obstacles that we put on the uh, in the path of the robot, but then also in the back of the building where um, we back of IIT building where we have a 25 meter space and we can just arrange it with with rubble and, and rocks that are, are not stable. We've also implemented reflexes on the top left. This is a step reflex that allows the robot to pull up the legs. Uh, in the in the center, there's a haptic crawl. The robot is blind here. It's just feeling itself uh, through it. Uh, on the top right, the robot knows about the environment. So it has a map previously obtained. Um, this was back in 2015. The robot has uh, offline optimized uh, a sequence of footholds and, and, and the whole body trajectories to overcome these obstacles. Then a bit later, we, we've uh, put the robot into this very uh, steep channel here. It's 50 degrees inclination on both sides. It's, it's, it's a quite high roughness. We added uh, a special high roughness here, uh, but still we needed to optimize the torques so that the, the ground reaction forces at the feet were pointing in the correct direction and, and, and stay within the friction cone. On the bottom right, you can see there's um, optimizations of footholds that allow the robot to, to overcome obstacles like uh, uh, ramps, gaps, and, and, and steps um, in, in, in these scenarios. Okay, so after this short historical overview of, of our research, um, I would like to talk about the most recent things. We're very excited to show you quadrupedal balancing and also line walking. This is something we haven't uh, shown yet and has just been accepted for IROS, so we're very excited about that. We will show you also a bit more about improved visual foothold adaptation, uh, some news about HiQ Real. We did more testing, of course, and, and I will talk a little bit about, about the roughness improvements that we're, we're doing on the robot, and then I'll show you a few recent results. So, quadrupedal balancing, we can have a look at nature. I like these uh, videos of nature. Here's a cat that is beautifully and, and gracefully balancing over a fence. And, and, and it, it does it so smoothly without thinking, one, one might think. Um, on the right, you see a video. This is quite low quality. I found that uh, 10 years ago on YouTube. It's a goat that is balancing on a rope in a circus. And I didn't show it here, but later on, the, the goat turns around on the rope goes back to the center and the, the helper puts a, a little vase into the center and, and the, the goat stands with all the four legs on, on that base and the monkey on the top does a little handstand on the, on the horn, something really, really impressive. And I don't think it's fake. So that shows that uh, line balancing or, or very thin balancing with quadrupeds is something uh, nature is doing uh, whether it's in a circus and they have to do it or, or it's the cat that just needs to balance over the fence. This could be applicable for quadruped robots when there's very few available footholds, not necessarily on a line, but still very few footholds where while you're positioning the legs to the next footholds, you're actually you, you're, you're balancing there and maybe you can't do a static, um, statically stable walk with um, a, a, um, a, tri a tripod, a support polygon but uh, you need to actually balance on, on two legs. So in the, in the robotics community, there has been recent uh, work that is uh, quite similar to us actually, but, but a different approach. There's the work of uh, Patrick Wenzing's team um, at, uh, with the MIT Mini Cheetah, but also a few years, few years earlier, IHMC was doing some nice work with Atlas balancing on the line. But uh, here both the robots are, are standing there and actually not moving forward. So, what we want to achieve is to, to map, um, to, to um, take an existing balancing controller that was proposed by Roy Featherstone that works with us here at IIT and, and map that into the quadrupedal case. So the idea is here to 
um, use a very simplified model. In this case, it's a flywheel inverter pendulum, and we have four states to control here, so this is the momentum and its derivatives, and, and Q2, I will show you a little bit more later on uh, what, what these things mean. Roy's team has implemented his theory in, in, in hardware, and SEP, together with uh, Roy's team, has worked on Tippy robot. This robot here has a flywheel with, with inertia weights on the sides, and it has a, an active degree of freedom that is, is based here. That there's a motor to, to activate the, the speed of the flywheel. And the joint down here in the base is passive. So it, it moves in the plane left, right, and you will see at the end when the, the machine is turned off that it falls into uh, one side. You can see it can actually track uh, reference angles. So the motion command, it can track uh, sine waves or, 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 or other um, um, reference trajectories here. This is always with the, the unactuated angle here in the base. You can see uh, for very aggressive maneuvers, the, the flywheel needs to spin very fast. And for a sign, it's a bit, a bit smoother. So this is uh, the underlying <coughs> technology, the, the underlying algorithm that we use. So now for us, it was the, the, the goal to map this to the quadrupedal case. So we still want to use a flywheel inverted pendulum model. We have as several states here. One is the, the vector that shows up. This is an estimated vector based on, on where we know the gravity is pointing to. There's the, uh, the, the, the velocities on the base rotation, and then there's the, the joint states. So if the robot is, is bouncing on, on two legs, there's a support line, and we put a plane that is ortho orthogonal to it, and we're adding a simplified model of the, of the uh, flywheel inverted pendulum, just two bodies. And this virtual model in the end uh, allows us to control these states here, the Y states, and they are the angles uh, representing from the base, Y1, and Y2 is actually the actuated the motor uh, uh, angle that allows the flywheel to, to spin. In the case of the quadruped, it can't really spin around, obviously, but it can still use its uh, hip actuators to, to move the whole torso and the two swing legs uh, for, for the balancing. So note again that Y1 is, is not actuated, it's a passive joint. It's the same here on the legs where the, the point feet are just um, standing on the ground. There, there's no actuation here. So then this um, results as in a desired um, acceleration of these virtual coordinates that are mapped back into desired accelerations in the joint space of, of the quadruped robot. So this is a video that the guys actually sent me um, this morning and I stopped the video so that I can show the most recent work that they've sent me literally 10 minutes ago, like at, at one minute before the talk started. I just managed to download it and open it. So here you can see that we're doing balancing on high queue. It's on two legs and Carlos is disturbing it here. The robot comes always back to its, its horizontal state. He's showing that um, the, the harness, the safety harness is, is loose, so there's no pulling here. And you can see that the height of the robot goes up and down. We can adjust this uh, virtual leg length to, to have it go up and down. And, and this uh, worked very neatly here. You see the robot is always um, uh, balancing a little bit. This is just the nature of, of balancing. There's always motion, otherwise, uh, it, it wouldn't be uh, balancing, of course. Um, some of these motions here are, are due to uh, inaccuracies in, in, in torque reference, in, 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 in torque tracking. There could be um, flexibilities in the, in the leg that can disturb the state estimator or the, the, the wrongly calibrated um, um, uh, identifica identification of the, the COM of the center of mass. So I can skip this earlier video. Um, so now, knowing that the robot can balance on these two legs, where uh, we worked on line walking that I mentioned in the beginning. So the balancer is the same as before. And you can see in this graphic here that the robot here has these states that get sent into this simplified virtual model here that produces uh, desired uh, acceleration states. There, there's the kinematic mapping to do this into the quadruped. Um, there's um, feed forward torque and desired uh, 
uh, position and, and velocities of the joints. This goes into an impedance controller from the reactive controller framework that uh, Victor Parswell, the, the second co team, has uh, developed a few years back. And this gets all summed up and, and gets sent into the uh, torque uh, PD controllers on, on joint level. And would we, th this is the, the, the one of, of, of before. Now, what we added is a state machine that can actually switch between just purely balancing to then um, uh, moving the, the base forward, replacing the legs, the swing legs on the ground, um, and then pull up the stance legs, the, 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 the previous stance legs to make them as uh, uh, swing legs again. And this uh, works very nicely. So the state machine switches through this state and the motions um, are, are not affecting the comp. Uh, the robot is always balancing, as I mentioned before. And we call this the ninja walk. We, we did a nice simulation about that. It's a full time sped up because the state machine is relatively slow because it always wants to be perfectly balancing again before it's moving on in the next state, but this can be sped up. So you can see the, the robot is here balancing on a six centimeter wide narrow bridge. And here in real time, you see that it is really, really balancing and, and moving the legs uh, forward one after the other. So we haven't had much time on the robot in the last month, unfortunately, due to uh, the, the lockdown based on the COVID-19. So we haven't managed to do this uh, much experiments on, on, on lion walking, unfortunately. So for now, you, you just have a simulation. If you're interested in this work, um, um, this is work of Carlos Gonzalez. He uh, has just had his virus paper accepted. I think we will put this on our side in the next days. All right, so the next point in my talk is about improved visual foothold adaptations. The um, dynamic legged robots, there's different examples here. It's not an exhaustive, it's not a, a complete show of, of dynamic legged systems here, of course. We just made a, a selection uh, for a few examples. So these are dynamic legged robots. And apologies if the videos are not the most recent ones. Um, here, the dynamic legged systems. And on the next slide here, we see the vision and terrain awareness. So, so robots can see with the onboard perception and, and know how to uh, change the, the, the footholds and, 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 and adapt the locomotive accordingly. Now, this is mainly on, on statically stable, relatively slow walking. So what what we would like to do is to have the dynamic locomotion of, of a trotting, of a fast trotting combined with the vision. And this um, uh, carries a lot of challenges in, in itself because uh, one is the, the very high density nature of visual data, the visual data processing time. So if you want to go through the maps in, in real time, then uh, this, this is uh, currently very uh, difficult to do. Uh, for example, on, on uh, full point point clouds, for example, so you will see how, how we, we address this. Then challenges are pose estimation errors, uh, map positioning inaccuracies. So for example, um, uh, one of the issues is that you uh, I think I'll, I'll talk about this uh, a little bit further ahead about uh, errors. So this um, lead, leads us to the, to the goal. We want to exploit visual information to improve dynamic locomotion on rough terrain using only onboard computing and sensing. And so these are videos that some of you might have already seen. This, this is work of Octavio Villarreal that has um, um, published this in a, in a raw paper last year. You see in simulation that some of the uh, footholds here are, are corrected. So maybe I need to uh, quickly explain. We, we, we get these, um, we, we have a, a, a nominal foothold uh, generator that generates the, the next uh, foothold here. In this case, it's the red ball. Maybe you can't see it. And then the uh, robot extracts a height map around that uh, nominal foothold. And there's a previously trained uh, convolutional neural network that can, in, in split seconds, can result and give a better, more optimized uh, footholds to correct, for, for example, to avoid uh, shin collisions, to, to avoid contour collisions, to make the, the robot not stand into the gap or, or away from, from edges. And you can see that in, in this simulation, the robot can very nicely sometimes actually step completely over um, uh, a, a step here, a, a stepping bar 
or, or stand twice on one if necessary, as we've just seen here. And on robot with, with Firefly, this is a half meter per second trot. The robot uh, doesn't know this environment previously. It, it, it sees it uh, live uh, with, with the, uh, the cameras and, and the height map is, is provided then uh, always around the nominal foothold. This works really nicely. Um, also, this works nicely when we're pulling the robot. So we tell the robot to stay in place here, but we're yanking the robot forward. Uh, Victor is here on the green leashes and uh, he's the, the robot wrangler to, to keep the robot disturbed. You can see if it does expect any. So this is work from last year. Um, uh, the more recent work here was uh, published in, in ICRA this year. Uh, it's about uncertainty in the photo adaptation. And there's three main sources of uncertainties. One is the swing leg trajectory tracking for the low level control of the machine. Might not always be so accurate. There might be a map drift or actually a state estimation drift. And uh, in, in, for example, if the, the foothold prediction error is, is probably the most um, fundamental uh, uncertainty here that we have. For example, the, the next nominal foothold is predicted to uh, based on the on the on the velocity of the base of the robot, and if that velocity estimation is is, is inaccurate, then we place the, the, the foot in the in the spot where we don't want to have it, or, or um, it, it creates uh, problems there. So, because in our approach, we're also while the robot is already swinging, we're still uh, measuring the base velocity and and can can make corrections even while it's still during the swing to, to then find the, the optimal foothold. I think it can do that uh, all the way until the half of the swing or a little bit later to, to then choose the, the final uh, new foothold that is, is, is safer. So in this case, to, to um, um, avoid it or, or, or treat some of these uncertainties here, where uh, we implemented an MPC, which is optimizing the ground reaction forces and can account the future states and this will lead to better foothold predictions and um, I didn't prepare uh, too many details here on the slides in, in the interest of time but we can see here in, in this simulation where a, a challenging scenario here where we have several um, bars uh, on steps on, on different heights different inclinations are, are randomly placed on top the robot is told here to just Roll, um, trot forward at, at four meters per second. This robot here is high Q real, so a 130, 135 kilo a robot in this model that can um, walk over here in the baseline. This is without the MPC corrections. Um, it's it's actually falling because uh, due to accumulated uh, errors in, in in terms of this um, base velocity, the, the footholds haven't been correctly. Uh, identified or, or, or placed. So in this case, where we use the new uh, MPC um, based controller, in, uh, we also added the leg inertia compensation in, in, in high key wheel. The legs are quite heavy. Um, so it makes sense to actually compensate for the leg inertia and all this together in, in several trials. Here you can always see on the top the baseline where the robot fails, and in the bottom you see the uh, the NPC plus uh, leg inertia compensation and, and gets over that uh, challenging terrain more easily. This has been a collaboration with Patrick Wenzing of Notre Dame. And at this point, I would like to move on to IQ real locomotion tests and, and, and some comments about ruggedness. Uh, as I presented last year in, in, in this workshop at, at ICRA, we've um, built Taiki Real. The robot is power autonomous, the robot is hydraulic, the robot weighs about 130 kilos, depending on what you're putting on top in terms of lasers and other payloads. Um, the robot here managed to, to pull this, this the airplane of 3.3 kilos. If you to see the extended version, you can go online and, and, and find this, certainly. We've done a bit more lab testing here in August 2019. It's written confidential here, but these uh, are not confidential anymore. We don't have time to, to edit these videos. Here we're showing four use cases that we have to do in, in uh, for our project together with ENIL. ENIL is a national body that finances this project. Uh, this particular project we have uh, walking down the, the stairs. We have walking up the, the ramp. We 
had um, here on, on relatively simple rubble in the lab. And we had here uh, the rubble on a very, very low crouched po position uh, going under a bar of 55 centimeters. And you consider that the robot is, is around um, 45, 50 centimeters in height, but if I can't remember now exactly. So, um, also more recent, uh, we've done some more uh, stair climbing. This is a video where we uh, have it sped up twice. I should have written that it's 2x. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we're using a crawl controller from Michele Focchi. This is uh, published in the Springer Starbook uh, now, I think 2019 or, or, or this year it came out. And you see that the, the heavy robot is, is climbing up these stairs here uh, with a statically stable, stable gait. Okay, now I would like to spend a few words on the ruggedness for quadruped robots. You can see in this uh, picture here that in the bottom of the robot here, we have a, a black additional thing. And some people on the YouTube comments I've seen they thought that this is an additional battery, but uh, it's not a battery. That's actually just us being careful not to damage the robot. Uh, it's foam. It's foam that was nicely decorated with black tape and then stuck on to the bottom of the robot to, to brace in, in, in case of impacts. You can imagine that if a robot of that weight, 130 kilos, is dropped down in case there's a failure with the legs, in case the controller pulls up all the legs out of, out of craziness or, or, or bugs, uh, which luckily didn't happen, we wanted to have something that protects the robot from these impacts. Uh, so we did have a belly protection here, the first black one, but that was was not really uh, optimized for, for these uh, heavy impacts that, that we, we could have. And so we added that extra foam. But um, we would like to have this a bit more optimized. Uh, this foam was, was a bit uh, last minute on, on, on the airport, us uh, trying to find a solution. So uh, now in this part of the talk, I would like to talk about our uh, work on the belly protection improvements and the leg protection improvements. We've um, started to do some FEM analysis. In this case, we're actually uh, having a weight of 140 kilos. We dropped the robot from 0 0.6 meters, just free fall, in case just the legs would completely lift up in a, in a split second uh, um, in, in the worst case. And this results in an impact velocity of around 3.5 meter per second by the time the, the torso um, touches the ground. And we've added, to make things more difficult, we've added a, a small cylindrical object here in, in, in this FEM analysis that has a three centimeter diameter and a three centimeter of height, because this represents a, a rock. If, if the robot obviously is on rough terrain, uh, there's rocks, things sticking out, and, and we're mostly worried about these things sticking out when the robot hits its full speed. So this is our simulation here. And based on, on those results, we um, developed together with an Italian manufacturer, uh, a very nice carbon Kevlar sandwich structured belly protection. This uh, weighs 3.6 kilos, it's, it's not light, but uh, it has this sandwich structure where you have an expanded polystyrene in the middle, 15 millimeters and 1.5 millimeter carbon Kevlar uh, inside and three millimeter carbon Kevlar outside. And we haven't had the chance yet to test this really on the robot, but um, we're gonna mount and use this relatively soon. The leg protection, similarly from this company, we were uh, ordering leg protections. You can see in the image of Haikyu Wheel, previously these were plastic 3D printed protections that um, look nice, but they're not very robust. Actually the robot, uh, fell once in the airport and one of these cracked. It, it didn't damage the robot at all. So it, it did its job because there's foam inside to, to absorb the impact, but uh, they cracked immediately. So we this year we went on to uh, improve the uh, external impact protections. This is um, mainly work of mechanical engineers uh, uh, in, in my team, Matteo Villa and Amit Sain. Uh, they've been working on this. So. This one here is, is a very similar geometry to the plastic ones we had last year, uh, and they fit nicely onto the leg. 
So I asked uh, Matteo yesterday to go to the lab and, and use a hammer, a metal hammer, and, and um, uh, do some shock testing on, on this leg protection. You can see he, he hammers very um, forcefully on it, and you can see that there's just some damages on the, on the upper surface of the resin of the, the, the carbon catalyst structure completely held uh, together. So this is very promising. Uh, this needs to be combined with shock absorbing material in the inside, of course, because that's how the energy can, dissipate, can be dissipated mainly if you look at the inside. And this leg protection here weighs 450 grams. It's again, three millimeter of carbon Kevlar that is nicely laid up in, into, this shape, shape, uh, into this shape. Okay. So I'm, uh, I've reached the, the, the last part of my uh, talk. Recent results, we've uh, had a clover pa paper accepted in 2019. I haven't talked about this yet. This is about shin collision, detection, localization, and then actually the re reactive action to, to, to take this particular location um, as a new, as a new, um, as a new contact point. And you can see here, the robot is doing um, a contact detection. The robot can understand where is it pivoting around. And it can identify where exactly on the lower leg is the contact happening. And you can see on the left, without the detection and without including that into the controller, it just slips down several times. Whereas on the right, you can see that this is now accepted as the new uh, foothold and the, the torques of the leg are, are optimized accordingly so that the robot doesn't slip and can more smoothly overcome this particular case. Um, we have also have two TRO papers, actually a third one that was just accepted a few days ago, but these two one here um, I've briefly shown last time already in the talk, this, this video I've shown last time, but this is a new video where we see uh, how Shamel Fami makes the robot trot on, on soft terrain. If you're interested in that work, it was also um, presented at ICRA. Actually, there's a Slack channel that is still active here. I should have put it. Um, it's a Slack channel that goes to that paper. If you have questions about this work, then write it there uh, in the ICRA Slack channel. Um, Shamel is happy to answer to you. The other work here is, is a, um, from Romeo Orsolino. This is also accepted for or, or already published in TRO now. It's uh, an extension of the support region. Everybody knows the classical support region, um, support polygon of of um, uh, legged systems. And here we're, we're adding the fact that the uh, torque limits are, are being uh, added into that very simple representation. You can see that the support, actually here the feasible region, not the support region, shrinks when you lower the robot because the, the torques um, um, are, are, are less, the available torques are less when the robot posture is down. So that is a very visual and nice a uh, way to, to, to work with that and, and also to use that in, in planners. Um, ICRA papers, again, they all have a Slack channel. I didn't, I forgot to put the number here, but you can find them. This is work by uh, Gabriel Urga from uh, the Netherlands. He's been here uh, as a collaboration with us and he's been working on, on cerebellum, uh, stabilizes reflex based locomotion on high key robot. And there's work from Angela Bratta. He's a PhD student in my team, um, supervised by Michele Focchi. Here you can see that he, he's been using um, a tower library by Alex Winter from ETH to then uh, improve that and, and take into consideration also limitations of, of, of joint torques and, and make the and, and shin collisions and make the robot more smoothly overcome uh, obstacles. We also have a a proprioceptive sensor data set for quadruped robots that is now online on IEEE data port. You can look into this. This is from uh, Jeff Fink, that uh, is a postdoc in my team. The work is only possible if there is a great team. These are a few impressions of when we did the um, airport um, uh, filming last year in, in, in Genoa. Uh, you can see the, the whole team, the logistics behind it, the trial, the um, the, the driving and the packing and so on. And I didn't find a more recent uh, picture because we've all worked from home, but there's no group picture of this year. The, the ones from 2019 are shown here. Um, 
go to our website, uh, dls.irt.it, where you can see also the, 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 all the members listed with the names, and you find all our publications as PDFs uh, there. And, and there's a YouTube channel and a Facebook group, so have a look there. Marco, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, it was great to see your updates from, from the last year. So let's dive in with the first question. So in your opinion, what do you think are the biggest challenges for you when it comes to the perceptive locomotion? Is it the state estimation, the mapping or the motion planning? Um, state estimation is, is, is a very important aspect because if your state estimate is, is, is wrong, um, you're not doing much on the map, especially if you can't see immediately where you're gonna step on. So this can happen if you have cameras only in the front and you're building a map and by the time your, your back legs, your hind legs are, are reaching those points, your, your map has drifted and, and you can't really use that map um, appropriately. There's ways in, in tackling this by adding different cameras also in, in the back or under the robot. But I think a real state estimation is, is, is very fundamental. You've also mentioned, um, the motion control, um, the motion planning. I think there's there's a lot to do if, if we're getting really into the research where we want to make the robots walk on, on, on very random terrains, not, not man-made prepared surfaces with a few obstacles on top, but really um, collapsed houses where there's there's rubble, where there's um, you know a metal bar sticking out uh, we have been to a rubble site uh, recently on red cross and and you know there's uh, the, the concrete that have the the built-in uh, bars where the, the reinforced uh, concrete these bars are, are really a, a hassle and i think when humans have to climb over that they can they can hold on to them and, and use them in a certain sense but for robots they're quite thin bars so i think there's, uh, there's a, a huge work that lies in front of us to, to do this in terms of uh, uh, controllers. Did you experiment a little bit with um, having sensors under the robot to? We have a bot camera. Um, not sure what's the most recent uh, update on that, whether this is already online, but we, we have a camera in the back of, of IQ Real. I don't think you can see it in this picture here, but, but it's, it's pointing probably covered by the license plate in this, in this picture here. And the next question is, what are the applications that you envision for the Haikyuu Reel? If you look into the next 10 years, what, what do you think, what kind of work could you achieve with Haikyuu Reel? Also compared to other quadrupeds, and I think uh, the biggest point is probably the payload cap uh, capabilities that the robot has. That's right, Marco. I think um, the the development of the more smaller electric quadrupeds that, that do amazing things and also your team um, have, have limited payloads, that's true. And, and for many applications, it's sufficient to have limited payload because maybe you just want to bring in a few sensors and, and, and do this. Um, so we see, we see, as you say, the, the more uh, heavier payload applications or the more heavy duty applications uh, where you need a lot of force uh, also on the robot, it's, it's something where uh, Haiky Reel can, can thrive in. There's also an additional benefit of, of the hydraulics on board. Many of the power tools that you would use sometimes in, in heavy duty applications, they are powered with hydraulics. So they have it for free already on the robot. And actually, the, when, when you would use an end effector with, with a hydraulic power tool on it, then the robot is static. The robot is not moving much other than balancing or, or, or doing small steps. So in that case, you can use the, the flow capabilities and the pressure of the, of the pumps to feed into that. Did you, do you already um, plan to do some demos with an arm on top and one of the power tools like that? There's, um, there's some news coming up later this year about the arm. Stay tuned. Okay, good. I will not ask more questions about the <laughs> Um So Demetrius asks, we see impressive results on HiQ, which was developed a few years back. What are the new capabilities of HiQ Real that the original HiQ were not able to achieve? 
Oh, so that's a good question. Um, one of the, the, the big capabilities, maybe not so much in terms of locomotion, but in terms of, of um, achievement for us, it's not a, a world achievement to put power on board, but for us, the step to, to get all the power on board with the hydraulics was, a, was an immense work and, and you know, um, chapeau for, for Boston Dynamics, how, how they did that in, in short time, I believe in 2004, 2005. And it, this is really, really the challenging part in, in how to make the whole hydraulic system on board with batteries. And so um, the, the new capabilities on the robot, now that we don't have necessarily a, a harness on top, that we're completely power autonomous, we can do things like bringing the robot out into and pull heavy things like the plane that we did. Um, in terms of locomotion capabilities, we haven't had the chance to do much more exciting things now on high real we've been using it a lot for for just the project deliverables and, and in the last few months was, was uh, anyway in lockdown we were working from home okay and the next ah uh, maybe you can stop your sharing of this uh, of okay. presentation. we can see each other yeah actually uh, there's one thing i i wanted to add i've, I've got to say that um, in the balancing, in the line balancing, obviously the, the, the joints that are in the air, so that the swing legs that are in the air, they can be used for useful tasks. So these, these things are completely decoupled. What, whatever the comm is doing um, uh, is then taken into consideration by the balancing controller. So imagine that if we had an arm on top or if we had um, the, the feet that need to do something in particular, this, this can be done um uh, independently from the from the from the balancing and this is very useful because also in the line walking while we're swinging the other two legs forward we're, we're, we can do that very easily because the, the, the balance controller uh, takes care of this it knows what is happening with the other joints and then incorporates that it's just something that came to my mind yeah. how different are these balancing controller to the mpc that you uh, that you um introduce in your talk the are these band the same controller or different Sorry? are these the same controllers or are they dif different solutions no they're different solutions um the the balancing controller of roy is 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 not an mpc uh, to be honest i um have to refer you to to, to roy or actually carlos to, to explain this a bit better to you this is Okay. Uh, very recent work that uh, I haven't had the chance to catch up in detail. And then there's one question: Have you ever tried a situation where you lose a limb or part of the limb? Um, I've watched the talk of of uh, Nick from uh, Australia, and and he was showing a nice video how the the hexapod was actually losing one leg. No, and it it, it goes into the DARPA in, into the, the tunnel. Um, no, we we haven't had that situation where we where we lose a leg. I mean, lose a leg can can happen in in case of uh, communication. That we lose a leg because we can't communicate anymore to the to the joint controllers. Uh, that can happen if if there's a wiring problem. We have uh, safety uh, layers built in that do sanity checks. If if there's uh, nodes that don't reply, then we, we go into a safety mode. Um, but that Mechanically, the leg was falling off. Uh, no, we haven't. No, that's, that hasn't happened. Uh, I think you already covered this question a little bit. So the next question is: question is, what are your next milestones of HiQ? So you mentioned end of this year you will probably show something nice with, with an arm. What are your next milestones where we should be up to date with you? in the next years um so yes i haven't covered really the, the future work we we have a number of projects going on there's a project with uh, vodafone so we're um, trying 5g with vodafone we're interested in, in understanding how we can do a proper uh, teleoperation with the machine uh, even in, in, in areas where you have um, no line of sight or, or bigger distances um so that's certainly one of the 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 things we're currently working on. The, the ENAL project, that's the one that uh, financed uh, at the moment uh, part of the IQ Wheel project. 
that, that project has uh, three other teams of IIT involved. Uh, one team, the one of Nikos Stagarakis, has built uh, an electric arm. Its electric arm will be mounted uh, on, on Haiki Reel. There's uh, another team that has uh, developed a whole virtual reality uh, around it that will give the, an operator the, um, the full immersion into what the robot sees through its own eyes. And uh, there's another team that is working on, on haptic masters. So we will have a haptic master that an operator can wear. It's, a, it's an exoskeleton for, for fingers and, and the arm that will allow a very uh, force controlled teleportation of this arm on top. Uh, that, that's as much as I can tell uh, so far. Um, that's probably the, that's some of the projects we're working on. There's uh, ongoing research uh, in, in, in locomotion. We uh, are working to extend the feasible region. We, we like that concept. We're, we're working on that. Um, working on, on the line walking, as, as, as you saw, we have a simulation going so far. And uh, we have several other things where um, we use the visual foothold adaptations um, for, for very fast motions. Yeah. There's one question by Marco Camuri. Uh, yeah, does the new carbon fiber cover provide only protection or also structure? Are you considering a combined tie cover that provides both structure and structure and protection to reduce the lack inertia? That is a good question, Marco. So the ones we have so far are protection. So the the, the mechanical aluminium design of the of the upper leg is the same. These are really add-ons that replace the plastic ones that, that you have seen as well in the lab. Um, combining it makes sense. We would really like to reduce the leg inertia. The leg inertia is, is, is way too high, even though we, we, we have controllers that can take care of those. Uh, we still would like to reduce it. Uh, any, any gram on the robot is obviously uh, less energy used. Um, we're, we're more thinking of that on, on the torso level than on the leg level for now. I think on the leg level, you need to have very accurate positioning of the joints. You want to make sure that the bearings are exactly there where you expect them so that you know that the, uh, I don't know, the, the hip flexion extension axis and the knee flexion extension axis are always perpendicular, are, are parallel to each other and, and you know the distance. And I have a feeling that if there's a, a carbon fiber layup structurally as well, not just for protection, then uh, you need to be very careful how you uh, embed the, the metal parts that, that carry the bearings for the joints. So um, I'm hesitating in, in going that way, but I know IHMC is 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 doing great work on, on, on carbon fibers where they use entire uh, legs uh, made out of carbon fibers and, and they're building in the joints there. And I'm sure other teams are doing similar things as well. So there are several questions um, in the YouTube chat because people are also watching it there. So the first question here is, how promising is the use of machine learning techniques like neural networks in exploiting visual information for motion generation and photo selection, in your opinion? Very promising, very promising. I think there's a, a huge speed up that we can gain through the neural networks. We can, we can train them beforehand on, on, on terrains and, and to, to then look things up uh, it's it's so fast, so there's huge potential, and I think we we will see much more work in in this direction by many teams now because this, um, thanks to the advances in machine learning and in in the computation, this is now opening up uh, nice possibilities. And what do you think in respect to machine learning and all the nonlinearities that you have with hydraulics? How much this how this could help you for your actuations? Um, so dealing with the nonlinearities, we could um, do machine learning to identify model parameters on the actuators. We haven't done that yet, but it's it's certainly interesting. Um, yeah, that, that would be future work. Okay, the next question is, it is really impressive that it is capable of pulling a plane. Looking forward to all the future applications with Haikyuu Real. What is the maximum payload weight it can carry? 
That's a good question because the payload question is something that I'm always curious also about the commercial uh, quadruped platforms. If, if it says in a line, the payload is, I don't know, 20 kilos or five kilos, what does that exactly mean? Where is this payload located? Is it right in the center? And what is the gate that the robot is still capable of doing then and, and, and the inclination of, of terrain? So I think the community needs to work um, a, a little bit in, in identifying a, a payload of, of a system, like we have specifications of, of washing machines and dishwashers that are all standardized nowadays. I think we need to have a standardization of, of what these uh, key performance values mean in, 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 in our robots that now are now coming into the market. To come back to the question, um, the payload uh, depends where we locate it and it depends how much battery we, we put in and how many sensors are already on top. But we're looking into around uh, to comfortably still walk uh, 30, 40 kilos around that. And that would be with a static walk, uh, walking. Mm, that could also be a trot, actually, uh, but I don't remember exactly what. Uh, okay. So probably with a static walk, you could even go higher. It could be, yes. And of course, it depends um, uh, where the, the center of mass of the additional payload is located. If, if you have it all the way in the front, then that makes the, the life for the, the control engineers very hard to, to keep the, the com in the, the support polygon. And the next question is, does having hydraulic actuator limit agility of the ro robot, like the range of motion of the joints that they can achieve? If yes, how much effect do you think it has on the overall robot locomotion, like stair climbing? Um, limitations in, in workspace due to the hydraulics, the if it, it depends. So the HiQ reel, for example, and actually also HiQ to Max and, and HiQ, all the robots have a combination of linear cylinders in the in the knee joint. The HiQ has it also in the hip flexion extension joint. Uh, these are linear cylinders. If you use a linear cylinder without the four bar linkage, then you're you're very quickly. If this is the torque curve, you really quickly go to very low torques at the at two extremes of the angles. And on HiQ. We have about 120 degrees range of motion, but uh, towards the the extremes, you have maybe 55, 60 percent of the of the peak torque. So that that is an issue and and uh, can be uh, addressed with four bar linkages. So we have a four bar linkage in 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 HiQ2 Max. We have one in in HiQ Real that can extend the range, and we are more freely uh, um, we're free to adjust the torque profile. There is um, rotary actuators that we use in the hips. So rotary actuators, the hydraulic ones, they uh, come in two, two different types. One is a double vein actuator, so it has two veins. Uh, it has double the torque compared to the single vein, but only half the range of motion. So consider that um, there's about 110 degrees range of motion that you can achieve in a double vein, which is not a lot for, for, um, for some of the joints, I think. Hip flexion extension joints don't need a, a huge range of motion, so we actually put the, the double vein there. Um, single vein, they have up to 270 degrees range of motion. Of course, an electric motor that, that would allow, um, you know, uh, much more than, than 270 degrees as well is, is, is for certain use cases better. Um, but of course, you need to address how the how the internal routing of the wiring is happening. And yeah. So there is also one last question: Do you think that we can achieve similar performance with electric motors? So I think that question goes then towards also: Can we achieve similar torque levels as hydraulics uh, with the same power density? Probably. Um, so one of the nice things of the hydraulics is the fact that um, it is very impact resistant. So you, you can have huge impacts on it and, and the structure doesn't suffer because the oil is inherently slightly compliant so that it can cope with, with these impacts and you don't have any gearing. Um, but if, 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 if I can talk about advantages that I see with the hydraulics, another one is, is cooling. So uh, you have liquid cooling already built in, which means to, you can 
uh, transport uh, the, the, the oil, the hot oil out and, and cool it somewhere in the torso where you have a lot of space available for, for plants. Um, I remember the talk of, of, of Nick um, that I watched recently. He's also saying that um, aptronic actuators they were suggesting or, or actually using liquid cooling as well, but um, to, to increase performances. And I think also the shaft shaft robot uh, has, has used liquid cooling electric motors. In terms of, of, of power density, I think electric motors are, are, are approaching the, 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 the power densities of, of hydraulics, but I, they're not there yet, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you a lot. I th we reached the uh, last question and thank you for staying with us for such a long time. And I'm thank looking you, Marco. to see more from, from your group. Sure, yes. Thanks thank a lot you, Marco. Thank you, Claudio, also. Grazie.